All right, we are pleased to be joined on the Bulls Talk podcast by none other than the Executive Vice President of Basketball Operations, Arturis Karnishevis. Did I get your name right? Yes, sir. See, I, I, for I, really wanted to, yeah, I really wanted to start there because it's funny. I've heard your name pronounced about seven different ways, and you don't do many of these interviews. So I did want to start there. If someone was to ask you to introduce yourself, what would you say? I I think after so many years of butchering my last name, I don't even know what the correct one is. I think it also was, you know, spelled differently when I was in college. You know, they added an H so you can pronounce it Karnishovas or Karnishovas. So it's, you know, it's closer to reality right there. All right, so I got it right. Yeah. But I mean, imagine PJ Kalisima in college was butchering that <laughs> name, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I didn't think he said anything other than swear words in, in Seton Hall. Arturus. <laughs> <laughs> what did he yeah. call you? What was his? It was what was his name for you? Artie. Huh? They called me Artie. Artie. <laughs> you were named Artie in college. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good one. I'm gonna file that one away, man. Yeah. That's good. Um, all right, so we got your name down, and that I, I'm jokingly saying that because you have not done a lot of this since you've taken over the job. You were hired during a pandemic, so I appreciate you giving us. And the Bulls fans a chance to kind of get to know you a little bit as a person. Glad to be here. And, uh, you know, now that you've agreed to this ask, you know what my next ask is, right? What is it? We're going to play horse on camera one day. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> Everything is downside for me if I lose. <laughs> we've joked about this, and I am, like, irrationally competitive. Well, if I win, it's expected, right? If I lose, you know, you're going to tell everyone. Yeah. <laughs> it would be on camera. Yeah. No, but we've joked about this, but um, – because I'm irrationally competitive as a lame Division three basketball player in my mid-50s. But, like, I feel like I've, as I've gotten older, I've gotten, like, more defiantly competitive, which makes no sense because I'm not very good. Mm -hmm. And you were a high-level, you know, international player and two-time bronze medalist. And here I am talking smack to you about playing you in horse. That's okay. We're getting older, PC. So are we going to do that? Maybe, yeah. maybe two years from now? Sure. All right. We'll get to that. Uh, but anyway, I thought it'd be cool to start with uh, 1997 because you guys are going back to Paris to play the Detroit Pistons in an NBA global game, and you were a part of the McDonald's championship in 1997 against none other than the Chicago Bulls. And I know you have some association with some members of the Bulls from the Dream Team, which we're going to get into, but what are your memories from that McDonald's championship in Paris in, in 1997? Well, there were great memories, obviously, playing playing the Bulls. But, you know, we played in the semifinals against the Argentine team. And we barely beat them, you know, by, by two, I think, or by one. Um, uh, and uh, then we played uh, Chicago Bulls. And actually, before the game, they didn't know if MJ is going to play or not because he had, a, like, a toe, toe problem. But he ended up playing and played pretty well. <laughs> Did you ever have to guard him? <laughs> Actually, so so internally on the team, uh, you know, everyone else guarded him but me. So I, I was mainly on Tony. And everyone tried to get in a photo shot, I guess, with MJ. Um, but, yeah, the the game wasn't wasn't very close. Uh, 104-78. Exactly. So um, we kind of hung in there first half and then it just got away from us and uh, obviously they went on you know to win another championship that same year yeah so. now obviously I was around that team early in my career that second 3 P team and I always felt like the defining characteristic of that team was it had like a rock star status to it there was always such excitement wherever they went whatever arena whatever hotel did you pick up I know you're competitive and trying to win mm -hmm. the tournament in that game but did you kind of pick up on the the rock star status to that that team in that era well you got to realize that you know at that time when you play chicago bulls they're already five-time champion you know that's a you know going for the sixth um and obviously growing up you know mj being your favorite player and uh you know played in 92 olympics um against the dream team and now 97 against chicago bulls those are amazing experiences obviously going into the game you want to win um that doesn't work out very well and uh, i was disappointed that it wasn't closer um i'm sure if mj wouldn't be playing that would be a little bit closer but 
Yeah, that is what it is. Leading scorer for Lithu- Lithuania that day? For Olympiakos? I'm sorry, Olympiakos, my bad. Good call. Uh, I got, I got. Yeah, I think it was. It was Artie. Yeah, Artie. <laughs> AK. <laughs> How many points? I think it was 19. Oh, yeah. You remember. I'm, check, yeah. I'm checking your facts. Oh, You're right. 19 yeah. points. Well, especially and those kind of experiences. You remember every yeah, detail. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I'm having some fun with it. But, I mean, those are pretty yeah. amazing experiences. Yeah. Um, and, by the way, for those listening that are deep Bulls fans, uh, future Bulls, Dragan Tarlach was a teammate. Yes, he was my teammate. He was a center. And here's a fun fact, which you did not know. That game was played on my 30th birthday. You, you didn't know me then, but or else you would have wished me a happy birthday. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Uh, but let's tie that into this trip in, in January against the Pistons because, I mean, you've been around the league for a long time. You've had a lot of international experience. My experience, having been with the Bulls in London and Rio de Janeiro, is these are really cool events for the league. It's a nice showcase. So what is kind of your philosophy and approach to the Bulls being in Paris in, in January? Well, is there's two types of games that NBA is obviously preseason and you know which is almost like a tour and preseason games which is more entertainment here's a regular season game so we're going to approach it as a you know must win situation and try to block out the noise try to enjoy ourselves but at the same time you know we're trying to get a w there and leave paris with uh with a win do you like all the kind of the you know sideshow events and the uh, extra community service naturally event. i do not <laughs> but because <laughs> you're focused on the i game. know it's part of it <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh so it just oh uh, obviously depends on how each player approaches and you know obviously coaching staff will will have meetings and you know we're going to try to prepare uh, against that you know before this game as much as we can and because we're going to have only one game that week. Right. So it's it's going to be all that week, all about that one game. Right. Pretty pretty cool, though, that the Bulls are going back to Paris after 26 years. It's amazing just because, you know, since I took this job, I, I realized what a global uh, brand, Chicago Bulls, and how many fans we have uh, around the world. Uh, France is a country that, you know, loves NBA and the loves basketball so it'll be really cool to come back to paris and and play there um in front of i would say not only a french crowd but I, i'm sure there's going to be uh people from all over europe maybe get joakim noah to be the hype man for that game absolutely he's going to be there of course he is <laughs> come on man <laughs> yeah. he's on the his way to qatar right yes. uh, as we tape this uh Anyway, you, you talk about international play, and I mean, who better to talk about the growth of international play? You've seen it really all. Mm-hmm. And I want to kind of get into your story because your, your story is a pretty fascinating one. When did you first kind of know you wanted to play college ball in the United States since that had never been done for someone born under the former Soviet Union flag? So growing up in Lithuania, you know, and – playing basketball my 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 father played basketball so I was around you know basketball and locker rooms and training camps and all that started to play when I was six and um, uh, leading up to my trip to obviously U.S. I played for the club team and I played uh, with Sharunas Marcelonis who was at that time already Olympic uh, Olympic champion and and he was contemplating going to to play you know an NBA and um, so I think uh, the summer of 1989 I played for Soviet Union junior team and we played a tour in USA 11 games around played best high school players in the country um, you know those days, I don't know, Kenny Anderson, Tracy Murray. Um, uh, so just a couple names. Um, but that's when, you know, colleges saw me play because that's the only way to see it. At that time, obviously, it was hard to get a video, and that's the, you know, you get 11 games live, you get a feel for a player. So that's when the conversation started. And then that same fall, I came with a club team to play uh, some preseason games in the fall with with some U.S. teams, uh, colleges as well. And and that's when the conversation started about, you know, uh, 
going to scene hall and uh i didn't know if it's going to happen because i was the first one to do it uh from lithuania from uh, that time soviet union and and here i am i stayed in us and still had to pass the sats uh it took me a while it took me uh a second time uh to 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 kind of uh, get enough uh, uh you know big score to to pass and you know to qualify and and uh go to scene hall but uh because my old english was you know street slang and you know, what i can do what can i pick up by myself um and i i did struggle with the language my first year in college uh because i took uh, so many classes that didn't count for graduation you know from reading writing and you know it took me a year to kind of catch up with the language and i took all the math classes uh, in order to be <laughs> eligible and then after a year they told me i can't take any more uh math because you have to uh major in math so i said no it's okay i'll major in economics uh, business school and uh so the sophomore year was much smoother than my freshman year but let's let's back up a little bit though because yeah. you you go home between the 11 friendlies in the summer with the junior soviet national team and then when you come back for the fall What's going on in that process? Obviously, I'm guessing you need a KGB clearance to come to the states. So, talk us through that situation. Well, I think I think the being 18 years old, there's a lot of you know ignorance. You know, you know, do you want to play college ball? Of course. How is that going to happen? I have no idea. So, there's a lot of stuff that. I don't know what happened and how I ended up in the US. Um but with the club team when we were leaving that fall we we make a stop and and because a, every departure international departure we had to go through Moscow oh, at I that time. That was going, yeah. You know, so you can't just leave from Vilnius. Uh so we in Moscow and we in Moscow for two or three days and I'm like why what are we doing here for two three days you know and and only later i found out that you know that's basically them waiting for a decision you know if they're gonna let me get on that plane or not so much later you know but i'm you know i'm 18 years old i have no idea what's going on you just you want to play ball i just want to play basketball <laughs> i just want to go i just I, you know i take uh you know uh, a bag and leave my parents and my friends um, in Lithuania I go to the States and try to live my dream you know and that's how that pretty much happened I just stayed in US you got to be pretty focused on that dream in order to do what you just said you did leave your family leave your friends go to a country you don't know the language mm -hmm. What, is that you were just that set on playing in the U.S. for college? And I think what, it's was, was easier it? to get used to. You know, it, a, you know, there, there's there's certain image of better life, you know, for you and possibly in the long run for your family. So you just you just go for it, you know. So that's what I did without you know thinking of consequences or anything. I just pursue my dream and wanted to to go and play college ball and describe your english proficiency when you first arrived and how did you get better well like I, I was watching uh shows price is right and uh <laughs> you know family feud and shout out to bob there you go there <laughs> you go so those are actually the that's the english language i learned wow quickly and you became a biggie scholar by junior junior year? and senior year yeah two years in a row that's pretty cool yeah, yeah, I was proud. What was your kind of initial impressions of America? I mean, because this is pre-internet, pre, -internet, pre mm -hmm. you know, everything. So when you're going to America that first time on those 11 friendlies in the summer, it kind of your wi eyes are wide open, right? Well, yeah. I mean, my memories, I probably knew about U.S. more than USA knew about, you know, Lithuania or, you know, how the things work in Soviet Union. So I, you know, all my experiences, even going to supermarket, you know, I've had 
family members that come to uh, go with me to supermarket and watch the so many choices of food and they start crying you know because that's those are basic things but you know i remember in the 80s uh, staying in line for <laughs> to toilet paper so you know it's just um yeah those are simple things that you know the experience first year and that we sometimes take for granted you know exactly yeah there's uh seton hall experience four ncaa tournaments played mm -hmm. for a legendary coach in pj carlissimo uh had a former bull adrian griffin as a teammate we kind of describe the overall experience there everything you hope great you experience yeah. for me it was met your future wife i don't get into yes. family much but yeah. second home for me um everything associated now with seeing all is you know obviously i love the memories stayed there four years uh went to nca tournament for four years in a row i had great teammates good coaches and you know got my got my degree um like you said met my wife um got married in seen hall chapel did not uh, know that so yeah so it's 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 institution that has wonderful memories for me and has a special place in my heart cool and uh you can't think of that experience with also without thinking of what happened in 1992 and i want to spend a considerable amount of time on on the olympics because there are so many layers to this story i mean let's just start with possibly the most famous basketball team of all time in the u.s version the dream team uh but a lot going on for you and your country yep. and you emotionally as well because it's the first time lithuania is represented at the olympics as an independent nation um Pretty powerful stuff. I don't even know where to start, except maybe I'll I'll try to start, then you can okay. maybe you know Good. find where to intervene. But yep. I think so. That trip for me to go back to Lithuania was first time in three years. So I didn't go back to Lithuania because I was partially was during you know obviously stormy time and break off you know from Soviet Union, and then while we were part of Soviet Union. You know there, you know, there was a m mili military. You know, two years that they would. You know, uh, a person after high school would have to do, and uh, so for three years I, I didn't go back. So when I when I went back, even when you know, knowing that Lithuania is now independent, and for you know, first week I've been like trying to learn things and was you know visiting my parents for the first time and it was unbelievable summer for me from like a personal experience and from basketball experience you know because after that year I didn't have a very good sophomore year because I had an injury I had a you know sprained middle collateral ligament in my knee I missed like two months of the season uh, I had just okay season. Now I'm coming back, and you know we're trying to put a team together to play for first time. You know for independent Lithuania. You know, and nobody understands. You know, again, you know we can go back. So there's so many layers. You know, there's no funding. There's no. You know, we have no idea how we're gonna have training camp, um, and it starts in Lithuania. So and but people don't remembers that we had to qualify for olympics that that summer and we had to play i think there were nine or eleven games that we had to play and we had to go qualify in one city then we have to then we moved on to you know it was i think it was a spanish city badajoz and then we had to go to saragossa and in saragossa we had to play you know croatia with petrovic and and obviously Tony and you know Ranko, all you know all those yeah. you know uh, great teams, and you had to qualify, and and we were undefeated, you know, to go and into Olympics, you know, with uh, Sabonis, with Marcellonis, and and the crew. So uh, it took us two months just to qualify for for the Olympics. So the culmination to go to Barcelona now and play uh, for Lithuanian that kind of event and play against dream team it was unbelievable 
as we both have alluded to, so many layers of this story. Mm-hmm. So the one I want to tackle first, although you mentioned the funding, I'm a little disappointed you're not wearing tie dye right now. But we'll grateful get into, we'll, yes, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. But I do want to start with what you said about because I want to make uh, if some listeners might have not caught this, the army commitment. Yeah, I mean. You have not been back in three years. Mm -hmm. Your country has become independent while you're in Seton Hall, but yet there has to be an element of you coming home going, looking over your shoulder, like, am I going to be forced to go be in the Soviet Somebody's going to knock on my door. Yes. Not on my parents' door, and they're going to take me, take me to the military. So, yeah, so it's just, uh, it it took me, you know, like first couple of weeks to understand that, you know, I think think I'll, I'll be okay. Now we can focus on basketball but again I I was after my sophomore year I'm still you know pretty young I had a at that time you know I don't know if you remember there were like you know headphones coming out uh, Walkman you know they they would you know give me a nickname American boy you know because obviously I spent three years in the states and um, so and then you know going back to funding again I'm you know the way you know i don't know if anybody anyone's seen the you know the other dream team the documentary it actually touches on it um great film yeah where you know marcellonis and uh, uh donny nelson go to grateful dead concert and then you know they wait after concert to have a conversation with them uh and obviously you know grateful dead then decide to 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 fund our dream and you know training camp and 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 all those trips and you know they were huge help yeah and our our obligation was to wear (laughs) the tie-dye but i enjoyed it because i i remember being on a on a pedestal and you know getting a bronze medal and i had a tank top (laughs) and shorts (laughs) tie-dye tie-dye yeah you know. Did you ever meet Jerry Garcia or Bob Weir? No, no I never. No, no I but did. You, but did you, did you know that? I, I, let me fill in some blanks first for those who have no idea what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. So Marshall, Sarunas Marshallonis is playing for the Golden State Warriors at the time. Mm-hmm. Amazing player. Mm-hmm. Amazing. I want to get into him and Sabonis in a second. Uh, Donnie Nelson is the probably assistant general manager for the Warriors at the time. His father. I think he was uh, coaching at that time. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Because this is this is the elder. Yes, Donnie before I think he hit the. Front. I was thinking younger mm-hmm. Donnie Nelson. I got you now. It's Don Nelson, the patriarch. Um, so they're in the Bay Area, and the Grateful Dead are not only philanthropists but they're basketball fans. So they hear this story about how the Lithuanian national team is looking for some funding to fuel their Olympic dream, and who better to spread peace and love and and basketball than the Grateful Dead? So this is why. Arturis Karnishevis is wearing a tie-dye shirt when he's receiving his bronze medal. Yeah. It's an amazing story. It really is. And it for is. those who have not seen the film, I highly recommend going to watch Finding the Documentary of the mm-hmm. Other Dream Team. Fantastic film. Uh, but just, again, there are so many layers to this 92 Olympic experience, and that's a pretty cool one. I mean, from your perspective, what do you th- – had you ever heard of the Grateful Dead, or had you, did you start listening to their music? <laughs> uh, yeah, I started listening to it because, you know, it was just a, such a big part of – our success that yeah. summer, um, but again, you know, I'm, I was sophomore after right. my sophomore in college, um, you know, and we're gonna get into you know playing not not only playing first time for you know Lithuanian national team but playing dream team. All right, let's do those two because yeah. those are the two. That's where I was going next. Mm-hmm. I don't know where you want to start. I think we should start with what it was like to represent your country as an independent nation as the first time without over dramatizing this i can only imagine the emotion and the responsibility you felt i've made those comments before that uh, playing for lithuania and playing uh, coming back every summer playing for a national team that was the, the basketball that i loved um and we played with some guys we played every summer it's just it was just uh, relationships and we played the style that was, you know, we would say that, you know, selfless style and, and, you know, we always called, you know, getting a bronze medal in Olympics. It's, it's, it's like a gold for Lithuania just because, you know, you know, you're going to see USA in the semis. Um, so it was always a lot of pride and, you know, to represent your country. 
And uh, you want to remind people who you beat in the bronze medal game? That just made it even more poetic. Yes. So at that time, it was called Unified Team. Um, so it's what's left from at that time from Soviet Union and. Uh, I mean, you can't write that. I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not going to win. Well, actually, people don't don't remember. We played them in a qualifier. Um, in Badajoz. And lost. And won. Wait, and you, won you lost, by a you, huge margin. You lost in the preliminary round of them. Though. We did. So, so we three played times. three times. We played in a qualifier where we won by 39 or 40 points. And then we met them in group. And we were up by 19. And we lost by 11. Uh, and then we met them again for for bronze medal. And we knew that we couldn't lose that one. Um, so that was a special, special achievement. It's an amazing story. How many points did you have in the bronze medal game? I don't remember that. Let's see, I did my research. You got the other one. You remember how many you scored for Olympia Coast? Well, that's that's a single that. game. Right. Yeah. You had eight points. Mm -hmm. And you're two more famous teammates no offense uh Marshallonis had 29 and Sabonis had 27 let's get into those two players those were again. rock stars I mean let's seriously those let's are break, best let's, two players that ever let's break those two guys down yeah. for those who never never got to see Arvita Sabonis play try to describe him and did you ever get hit in the head with by a pass well it de <laughs> depends when you when you you know like in the mid 80s the way he looked is 7-4 uh player that can you know pretty do you know pretty much do you know passing you know, pass, score, shoot threes, you know, block shots. Um, he played above the rim. He was running, you know, fast break like a gazelle. I mean, it, it just, you know, all the injuries that he sustained um, before he actually came and played for Portland uh, at 30, you know, at the age of 31. Um, it was a, probably a shadow himself that he could have, you know, he could have really had a great NBA career. And then, you know, Marcellonis was, you know, another guy that changed the image of European players, you know. Like, I remember, I think uh, uh, Chris Mullen was describing European, you know, like this not very athletic, probably soft or something like this. He was everything opposite of what the European player is going to look like and he was just strong and obviously character you know in terms of very competitive uh, I know that because I played one-on-one -on -one against him you know every day when I was in the club you know he took me under his wing and a lot of a lot of it you know what I've you know practiced and trained I trained you know with him you know, when I was 17, 18 years old. And then when he went to Golden State, uh, he was, you know, mentor of mine and helped me out. And I would go to visit him when he played, you know, in the Golden State. It was great to watch him play, you know, at that time, you know, with uh, uh, Tim Hardaway and Chris Mullen and Mitch Richmond and all that that brand of basketball when they, you know, run and gun. We'll love to watch that. So who's better passer, Sabonis or Joker? Joker, put you on the spot here. So <laughs> I actually <laughs> I've been asked before. I think Joker for for a reason because he can actually bring the ball up. Yeah. And and that's the complex, you know my memory of Sabonis is actually, you know, first time in practice. You know, I I pass you know and you know pass the ball to Sabas and I cut and I, I I see there's no way the ball is gonna get to me and he finds the ways to get and he actually the ball hits my face and I get you know r bloody nose and since that day I always expect the ball from from Sabas regardless of where your defender is so um, so you know. Sabonis was great passer, great passer. He actually demanded the ball to give it back to you, and it's it's hard to find players like that. And Amazing player. So. Um, all right, we're gonna get into the the dream team itself because there's obviously the famous picture of you taking a picture of them mm -hmm. from the sidelines. I mean, I was alluding to the rock star status of the dynasty era Bulls before. You could multiply that times maybe ten with that 
a semblance of talent. I mean, it yeah, was ridiculous. just growing up watching those players and idolizing them, and you know, again, I'm a sophomore in college, and I had to guard Charles Barkley. How'd that go? Did not go well. Uh, I fouled out, and. I'm sitting on the sideline. It's like nobody's taking pictures. So I'm like, I'm sitting there with like two minutes to go. We we down by 45, you know. And I, I start taking pictures. But then when you know we got the uh, the film back, there were pictures of me actually in in those pictures. So somebody else obviously also took some pictures while we were playing. I was just got caught on film <laughs> doing that. But absolutely. Absolutely not embarrassed because that's, you know, those were our idols at that time. And the separation, what people don't remember, is the separation between the NBA players and internationals was so, so huge. The margin of victory was uh, so great. Um, and then, obviously, year by year, it got closer. But at that time, it was still surreal. Yeah, you could even you could even measure it from ninety two to ninety six because you played them more competitively in ninety six. In ninety six, yeah, we problem, lost by medal. twenty, which is you know less of you know, and and losing by twenty was the I think smallest margin of yeah. of of victory that they had in the Olympics. So. When you look back at playing the dream team, so you had brief association with Michael and Scotty, playing the Bulls with the Olympiacos in ninety seven and your position now. You talked about this a little bit at your introductory news conference, but it's pretty kind of amazing full circle life moment. I mean, what responsibility do you feel to the franchise given its history and you know your association with those members of the past? Well, it's amazing to think about it, you know, that it came to fruition. I could never imagine that's gonna, you know, come to this and, um, being a fan of Bulls and, you know, in the 90s and uh fan of MJ and Scotty and and now working for Bulls organization, I'm living a dream. So, but I still have, I feel like I have a connection to organization and, um, uh, you know, like I said, you know, I'm very proud to be here, but there's a lot of work to be done and, um I'm hopefully we can get something done here. Um wrapping up the 92 Olympics for those that don't remember, PJ Carlissimo, assistant mm -hmm. coach of the Dream Team. That must yeah. have been fun for you too. That was interesting because when we played the uh, Dream Team, so he's on sitting on a bench and I'm shooting a free throw. And you know, I kind of look at him on the bench. He's smiling or he's mouthing off something and you know, I'm shooting a free throw. So it was fun. It was fun knowing that your college coach is on Dream Team bench. And actually, after that game, we both teams we took a, uh, took a picture in the middle of the court. Uh, it was it was special there. So. Where are your bronze medals? Uh, you know, somewhere at home. Which home? <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> I'm not gonna go steal them. I just yeah. want to know. There you go. Do you know where they are? Yes. Okay. Yes. And more importantly, where are those pictures? The pictures, uh, they are somewhere in the attic. <laughs> somewhere. Yeah, they're somewhere in the, in the box. Somewhere. That is a pretty cool image, though, of sit, sit, you sitting there in a uniform on the sideline taking pictures. Oh, absolutely. It well, really just it kind of encapsulate, encapsulates. And obviously there's the, the high-profile story of Angola, you know, asking for autographs after the game. I mean, people in this day and age that are just growing up with the Internet and everything – I don't think you can understand the mythic sig power and the significance of that 92 team, mm. right? No, the, I mean, the the roster of that oh, team was, ridiculous. you know, there's so many players that, you know, in the 80s and 90s, you watching them growing up and idolize them, so. We're on my last page of notes, aren't you excited? Very. <laughs> so you didn't get drafted. Uh -huh. 94 disappointment or? very disappointed yeah so after my junior year i had a chance to kind of leave for the draft and uh, now it's called early um early entrance uh and i could have left also played you know overseas and stuff but i stayed i wanted to get my degree 
I wanted to stay one more year in college um, and, you know, play for Scene Hall. Uh, so um, a lot of our very good players left after my junior year, you know, including Terry DeHair and Luther Wright and Jerry Walker. Um, and we made an NCAA tournament barely. You know, we lost to Michigan State in 1994. So now I'm starting, you know, I'm starting this pre-draft you know experience and i go from camp to camp and you know obviously combine in chicago um good experience but the expectations is to get drafted you know and and i don't i don't get drafted so now obviously huge disappointment um and i i went to portland summer league played for portland played for milwaukee and ended up in training camp with Milwaukee, um, with Milwaukee Bucks in 1994, uh, right when they uh, drafted uh, Big Dog uh, from Purdue. And the day before the season starts, I get cut. And now I'm in October, and I go and play for national team in the qualifiers for Europe while thinking what am i going to do and i uh, play in the qualifiers and then get a call from french team cholet and get you know get a job with cholet uh played the rest of the season there and played in europe you know from there on eight years Good. Played eight years, played in Cholet, played in Barcelona, played in uh, Olympiacos, Athens, played in uh, Fortitudo Bologna. And in 2002, I decided to retire at 31 years old. I thought I'm going to, you know, sit somewhere on a porch, you know, play golf or something like this. First three months, I was like a lion in the cage. What am I going to do now? And I couldn't wait to start my, you know, new career. And I started working for, at that time, a financial firm called Asante uh, in New York City uh, in the financial world. Those were my, you know, first, uh, I was inspired by, you know, by financial world and, you know, using my economics degree. Um, so that's where I worked my first year. 2002 to 2003 uh, and that's where a call came from you know Kim Bahuni who was working in the NBA and said hey you know our tourists you know the number of international players are increasing in our league uh, you know I need help and uh, would you want to join me in the league office and you know basketball operations uh, uh, department at that time Stu was uh, was the head and, and that's how my NBA uh, journey not on a court started so all right so got a few blanks to fill in here this, that's my job as the as the host of the podcast yes, sir. Uh, eight year career you kind of glossed over some some MVP awards in the Spanish League and mm -hmm. some FIBA and awards you, you had a very even though it was a disappointment not to make the NBA, you had a very solid international career. Mm -hmm. um, your major at Seton Hall was finance, correct? No, it was economics. Economics. So the, the financial decision makes sense. But what I want to know is why you're working 2002 to 2003. Are you thinking you might get back into basketball at some point? No. No, you're no at that time, I'm, I'm committed yep. to financial world. Yeah. Did you and miss it while you were out that year, or did you, did you enjoy that year working in finance? I enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, Eye-opening for me. Yep. And when you, you know, I was that same athlete that, you know, making that transition into real world. Yep. And it's challenging. Yeah. You know. Uh, but I had this clear vision, you know, that I want to be in a financial world, you know, you know, for, you know, my first year. Uh, but... At that same time, I was missing basketball. Yeah. Right. Not as a player, but just to be around. Be around the game. Around the game. So, so when you know, um, uh, you know, to to elaborate more, you know, 
Kim Bahune at that time, vice president of basketball operations, she uh, she also was uh, hugely involved and helped me to come and you know to join Scene Hall. Correct. Um, so when she she made that call, it was intriguing to me. I still had to uh, do a lot of you know uh, self development and you know to to kind of uh to be exposed to business of basketball um uh get back to um uh kind of uh, company setup uh at that time I would say like you know description of IBM setup is in terms of writing reports uh you know um weekly reports daily reports it, it, you just had to get back to that grind and um but there, there 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 was a lot of fun too you know because we were you know our department was you know overseeing basketball without borders you know and and those were the fun projects that you would do all year long and um you know by running those camps and uh, in in three four different continents uh, that experience was Priceless. So I want to fill in just one last point on Kim Bahuni. For those who don't know, not know who she is, she's long been uh, involved in international basketball. I believe her title now is Senior Vice President of International Relations for the NBA. Arguably one of the most influential people in international basketball history. I agree. I agree. Her relationship with an international world, with all the federations and the, the connectivity that she had for years and years, and how that contributed to NBA uh, and USA basketball is 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 unbelievable. Amazing. I I had the fortune of good fortune of speaking with her when you were hired as Bulls EVP, mm-hmm. and uh, she gave me a great phone interview about your guys' relationship and, and your background. But she she really is one of those behind the scenes people that people have no idea how much impact she's made on the game of basketball. So, Absolutely. Uh, so she calls you, and you've kind of talked about this a little bit, but you did work for the league office from 2003 to 2008. Your main task, among many, was to travel the world and put on these basketball without borders camps. And at the times, those were almost more like camps or clinics. They've almost grown in, in some instances, to be fairly competitive tournaments. Mm -hmm. But it was pretty grassroots when you were doing it. Oh, absolutely. There were, you know, probably five people doing it, uh, where they have now a ton of people, you know, 30 people running it. Um, Yeah, I mean, I remember 2004, we had... um, basketball without borders africa and and we we had this all-star team and we created this all-star team and we brought these uh players to us to play high school high school teams and they had 11 games so it was me and at that time brett mctavish who worked with me we rented two vans and we were drivers we were chaperones we we brought those, you know, those kids and, 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 and the coaches around San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas area, and they played 11 games. And most of those guys got, you know, scholarships later and, you know, and played in college, and some of them were pros, and, and that's gratifying, you know. Were you, you, you leave in 2008 to become an international scout for the Rockets and then move on in your career path mm-hmm. to where you are now. Were you looking to move from league to team, or did that just kind of happen organically? So when I was working, you know, in the league office, I think my idea of working for the team was kind of forming. Uh, I wanted to be on the team side um, and start exploring, you know, should I go back to Europe, you know, and work with the team there? Should I stay in the NBA? And I did in the kind of like informational interviews with a lot of executives in, in, in the league at that time. And they all said, look, just take, you know, take a position with the team in NBA and work your way up. And that was the right path for me. And, you know, at that time, you know, I was like Houston Rockets took a, took a, took a shot at me. And I'm thankful uh, for Daryl and Gers and, um, and I was with Houston for five years. They were, um, so those were, you know, f- 
first five years on the team side. Uh, again, the path of working your way up. I got to the point where you know, director of scouting. I'm, I'm organizing, you know, pre-draft workouts and and so forth. Um, and in 2013 is when I get a call from from Denver when Tim Connolly got a job in uh, with the Nuggets. Another guy who's got international background. He may be from Baltimore, but he's been in a few gyms around the world, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you worked for the Nuggets for seven years, and now you are here, obviously, and uh, just a few more. Uh, what, do you, what do you like about roster building now that you're working on the team side? What, what, what appeals to you about roster building? Well, you know, there's a pluses, pluses and minuses, right? So uh, the minus is obviously how little impact you have on – you know, uh, on the games itself, um, but you have a impact on uh, roster uh, and team building during, you know, trade deadline, draft, free agency. So that's very appealing to me, and um, and also not just building the roster, it's building the staff, building the, the group that you trust and building something together because without your group, you can't, you know, you can't just do it alone, so. That's why it's called basketball operations. It's Absolute, the whole, you're, you're in charge of it all. Um, I've asked you this privately. I'm gonna ask you once publicly. How have you found the move from number two to number one? I think the experience in Denver was really good for me because I a lot of stuff that you know I do with the Bulls I implement I mean you know some of the philosophies we we had in 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 in, in Denver um but I think at the end of the day, it's more like, you know, your your name basically go, goes on every decision, you know, as a number one and responsibility. I think that's the difference is, you know, your name is everywhere. Hey, you're going to get, you know, praised if, if you know, if, you, if you're successful and if you're going to get criticized if you're, uh, you know, you're not successful. So, and, and it's okay. I accept that. Part of the job. Yes. Um, all right, lastly, and we so appreciate your time here on the Bulls Talk Podcast. Thoughts about Chicago, the city? I'm so glad I got to enjoy it, you know, you know this year more and more. Um, uh, I, I enjoy the fan base and how, how much they love the team and how involved they are. And I love the media. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in terms of city and you know obviously the uh, i always said that you know a anytime i take those kind of uh river tours <laughs> it's probably most beautiful city in the world for me um and uh yeah but in terms of chicago as a city and this organization i didn't realize how iconic that is uh until i got here uh what a global brand that is and I'm really proud to be part of this and uh, chasing the success of this organization and trying to, uh, you know, trying to get to winning ways and how we're going to do it, when we're going to do it. It's, it's still to be seen, but I enjoy the process uh, with uh, people that I work with and, uh, and I enjoy working for this ownership. Awesome. Well, we so appreciate your time, Arturis. Or can I call you Artie? Yeah. <laughs> Artie, what are you doing? <laughs> with, with, with a certain yeah, yeah. Uh, modifier before, what are you f? Yes. Uh, what are you uh, doing? I, I had no idea that you know that you know the the combination of sentences and structure could be could be that way yeah, I until say, I got to Seton Hall. Yeah, you get to Seton Hall and you're, you're in your first class <laughs> dropping f bombs because your coach is doing yeah, the same. Exactly. A shout out to PJ. But no, seriously, uh, I know you don't like talking about yourself a lot, but I just thought it'd be 
a good opportunity for fans to, you have an amazing backstory from my perspective. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm into storytelling. That's what I got into this business for. And I appreciate you sharing it with us and our listeners. Well, thank you. Uh, we, like I said, you know, we, we deeply care about this organization and, you know, shout out to the fan base. You know, we're trying to do the best that we can and it's, it's not fun when we lose. I, you know, I'm a very competitive person. That's what you need to know. And I don't take those, you know, losses lightly and I get emotional just like you. And, you know, we're trying to turn this around.